these have three distinct periods. They have a growing period, a blooming period, and a rest period. Now, the tropical species have less of a rest period, but because all of our heat-tolerant, warp-tolerant hybrids are mixed with the cool ones, they still have a bit of a rest period. The rest period is, as you would suspect, in the winter when it's drier or cool. For growth, the plant is making new growths, new leaves, new pseudopods. It's building next year's plant. It's also working on those inflorescence primordia. That little bit of tissue that will become a flower spike in flowers is what it's starting to work with. But what you want to feed right now more than anything else is you want to feed that plant's ability to make more plant. That means a lot of nitrogen, a lot more nitrogen than anything else. So a, a 30 10 10 works really, really well. We're starting to understand more about orchids and fertilizer. We know that they don't like a lot of potassium. Now, that being said, I use 15 15 15. I use it year round, and it's got calcium and magnesium in it. Essentially, the MSU formula that you guys were talking about. But I supplement with two different kinds of pellet and fertilizer at different times of year to increase either nitrogen or phosphorus, depending on what I'm doing. Blooming, when they're making flowers. Standards do it in the spring. Yes, ma'am. Again, what were the names of the supplements to the MSU? Um, I use NutriCoat. Is, and it's got to be NutriCoat. You can find NutriCoat or Dynamite is when they package NutriCoat small. Do not use Osmocote. It will burn your plant's roots. Don't do it. Um, and I use Peters, which is no longer made by Peters. And now I'm talking to, I'm talking to, actually, I'm talking to Jack Peters because he started making fertilizer again up in Pennsylvania. And I'll probably be using his stuff, but his old formulation, which is essentially 15-15-15 MSU. This is made with calcium and magnesium and micronutrients. Okay. Blooming. So, again, two distinct kinds of orchids here. We have these standard ones that bloom in the late winter, early winter, late winter, spring. Um, and then we have the tropical ones, these little tiny ones that are heat tolerant, that tend to bloom in the summer, particularly in August at the end of the summer. Now, how many people use a bloom booster on their on their um, on their plants, you do, you do. What kind of do you grow? All of them, just just a mixed collection. Yes. You same thing. Maybe not enough. Do you think you see a difference? Not yet. Okay. Here's what I know about these plants. They grow in the Andes. They have a very very wet season. That's what the monsoons are called, and they get rained on a lot. What happens when the rain stops? It's not that the phosphorus increases, guys. The soil dries out. The percentage of phosphorus in the soil goes up because the percentage of water is going down. And that is a huge signal to these plants that it's time to bloom. It's not just the shortened days. It's just not, it's not just the, the, the drop in temperature. There are a lot of things that go into seasonal orchids. And what I know is that the people who use phosphorus and think they have an increase because of the phosphorus, it's not because of the phosphorus directly. It's because the plant is responding to a new set of circumstances that mimic in the wild when the plant's getting ready to go into rest and when it should bloom. And that being said, the ones that bloom in summer that give us our heat and warmth tolerance don't eat this. So should you or shouldn't you? I don't know. I don't. I don't see any difference. But I don't know, because I've got really good friends who are excellent growers who swear up and down that there's a difference. I think there's probably a difference in the Nobile dendrobiums, and that's it. So rest, when they go into rest, it's just maintenance. Again, they want to be kept moist, but they're going to do less. They're not growing, they're not blooming. Generally, right after they bloom, they just want to rest. You've got to give them a chance to recuperate for next year. At that point in time, you can decrease your fertilizer, you can decrease your water. You don't necessarily have to decrease your light. A lot of people think that in the winter, plants need less light. Indeed, most plants that grow in the tropics, that grow in any kind of environment that could be associated with being deciduous, for example, Mexico, on the west coast, like the northwest coast of Costa Rica, there's a good example. The northwest coast of Costa Rica is a desert for most of the year. And then the wet season, Boom, all the leaves come out. 
So when do plants get more light when they're growing on those trees? In the dry season, when there are no leaves on the trees, or in the wet season, when there's an umbrella over there? Exactly. So you don't have to change the amount of light they're getting. They're not doing anything, okay? Moisture. Constant moisture is essential to consistent culture. The best thing you can do as an orchid grower, or as a grower of anything for that matter, I don't care if you're growing beans or peas, or philodendrons, or orchids, or bromeliads, is providing consistently what they want, okay? And cymbidiums want to be kept moist. They like it moist, not damp, not wet. They want it so that if you pull a cymbidium out of its pot, put it up to your face, you ought to be able to feel the cool moisture that is there, okay? And if you can keep that consistent throughout the year, Living on a tree out in the jungle is not easy, okay? You gotta worry about a whole bunch of stuff. Living on the ground with the foot of the hip. What's the water quality like that? Yeah. Not good? Is, is it alkaline? It's like mineral, yeah, mineral lake? It's, yeah, it's kind of like where I'm from too. It's all coral. You know, you go 20 feet down, it's all coral rock. Uh, so it comes out of my ground at 340 parts per million. And uh, when I used reverse osmosis water, came out of the tap 40 parts per million because the, the membrane was old. I put in enough fertilizer to get to 250 parts per million. If you have a chance, take a bit of your water and send it to your local, uh, you know, the, the state ag office and have them just tell you what's in it. A lot of times they can tell you what's in it, they don't even need it. But water quality really does make a difference. When I was 14 in growing orchids, I didn't care, I didn't know. I was just struggling with the idea of keeping them alive. When I switched to rainwater, I noticed the difference within the first week. And when I switched to reverse osmosis water, it was like a miracle. The quality of water matters because everything in that water but water, who knows? Who knows what it's going to do? Who knows what ratios it is? How much, is, how much heavy metal is too much or too little? What I want when I water my orchids is I want to give them exactly what I want, which is water. If you have a small collection, Go spend 89 cents once a week for a gallon of reverse osmosis or distilled water and use that. If you're using it out of the tap, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Plenty of people do. I'm not saying your orchids won't grow well. Some of them grow great. Most of them will grow well as long as you're consistent. What I'm saying is they'll grow better if you use better water quality. Yes, sir? Will we better distilled water or reverse osmosis? To be quite frank, Practically, there is no difference. Reverse osmosis cannot remove everything. Most RO water that's sold in stores, and if you go look at purified water, it will say that it's distilled both with reverse osmosis and distillation. Distilled water is just distillation. Distilled will produce much purer quality water with one pass. Reverse osmosis can't do that. But it takes the mineral content so low, practically it makes no difference. What's the advantage of using the outer wire over the rainwater? I can't control what's in my rainwater. You know, if I collect it off my roof, I don't know what the roof tiles are putting into it. I don't know what it's collecting when it falls on one day versus the next. You know, I like to know. Problems. Orchids are not without their problems. You're going to have them. I have them. It doesn't matter how good a grower you are. If you're not having problems in your orchid collection, you're not growing enough orchids. <laughs> so the biggest problem that I see in some videos that, that really irks me beyond everything else is bud rot. And bud rot can happen for a variety of reasons. Most often in some videos it happens because there's a spike in temperature at night. It's just too warm. There are ways to combat this. <laughs> <laughs> Milton has a 20 foot by 20 foot room that he keeps refrigerated at all times in his greenhouse. He's got three air conditioners on it. He grows some amazing stuff in the heat because it's never very hot in that room. Most of it gets to a 70 degrees at night. But if you can bring them in where it's cooler at night than it is outside, you have to be consistent, obviously, but as that spike is developing, if you can get it into cooler temperatures, it's a lot less likely to have those buds drop. The biggest thing that contributes to bud drop aside from that is any other abrupt change in, in, in the environment. And beside that, the only other thing is ethylene. 
methylene dioxide. And unless you're burning something really close to your orchids, you don't have to worry about that. If you've got a bad heater in your enclosed greenhouse, man, you're going to have some issues. But most people never experience ethylene dioxide. If you want to experiment with this, take the next organ that you have that's producing flowers, put a plastic bag over it, and stick a banana underneath, and watch what happens. It will drop every bud before it even gets half a chance to open. Leaf tip burn. The main thing that I see causing leaf tip burn is not enough water. And the reason that causes leaf tip burn is because it's not because there's too little water. It's because the concentration of minerals in that mix goes way up. Think about it. 25, say you have, let's say my water, 250 parts per million of a mineral in your water. You take away half that water, you're at 500. You take away half of that, you're at 1,000. And it's the high mineral concentrations that burn the tips of roots and burn the tips of leaves. Other things that will cause this, low nitrogen, low calcium. Calcium is almost always associated with magnesium. You see a lot of CalMag in CalMag supplements. So magnesium might have something to do with this too, but it's not going to be without its interaction with calcium. Calcium deficiency is another thing. Yeah, yeah. Rotting new growths. I have been forced to, for several years now, grow basically outside. I grow in a semi-automated, semi-protected shade house. That's changing. But the worst thing is, when the rains start, if I don't keep everything dry, if I don't regularly apply some kind of fungicide, I feel a lot of that black rot that you see. Mm -hmm. And you can smell it too, a lot of that brown rot. You know, you get it, it smells that funky, sweet, weird smell. That's our winning. And that's what really does these things in. Because if you've watched it work, it'll melt a cattleya growth in a day. You come out one day and there's a little black spot on the tip of the leaf. You come out the next day and the whole thing's mush. And it really, really does this to, uh, to the suitables of, of some videos. Fluorosis, nitrogen deficiency, also magnesium deficiency. That's when you see these leaves turn this mottled yellow green or a uniform yellow green. And you know you've got enough magnesium and you know everything else is right, you're not putting enough nitrogen on it. And then pests, the same pests that affect everything else. The really bad one are spider mites. And the really bad ones, you know, it's the winter. It's when everything dries out. Spider mites love cymidium leaves. They love them, underside of cymidium leaves. Really, the only way to get rid of them, you can. The best way to control them, if you're gonna use a miticide, okay, if anybody in here is going to use something, I've got mites, I need to use a miticide. 90% of using a miticide is where you put it. If you don't put it on bugs, it's not going to kill them. And they live on the undersides of leaves. Coverage is everything. I use a sprayer that produces a fine mist, and it takes me a couple of hours. I go underneath all the leaves. Fortunately, I don't have to do that for a long time. Thrip, scale, slug, snails, I, there's, you're not going to get away from pests because you're growing a different genera. Spider mice, like I said, they're the worst. Okay, this is going to scare everybody, virus. How many people are terrified of virus? How many people have heard of orchid viruses? How many people have plants that are virus that you've seen that you know are virus? Have you ever tested a plant for virus using those little strips or anything like that? Good, good. You don't have to be terrified of virus. Plants are like anything else. They can adapt, okay? There are genetics. There are consequences to long-term exposure to pathogens. One of those things is resistance. Now, I'm not saying that these flowers are resistant to infection because Cymidium mosaic virus and Cymidium flect virus will, will destroy a Cymidium collection. But you may have plants that are virus that you don't know about. This is particularly prevalent in antique cattleyas. I collect antique cattleyas. About half of the cattleyas I have have Cymidium mosaic virus. You wouldn't know it. They grow great. Nothing happens to the flowers. But a lot of people are terrified of virus. In Cymidiums, if you start to see weird speckles on your leaves, 
if you start to see changes in the flowers that you cannot explain any other way, you need to consult somebody and see if it's got virus and you need to, you really need to put that plant aside away from your other things, okay? Because Cymbidium mosaic virus and Cymbidium flect virus will affect Cymbidiums more than most organs. And Cymbidium flect virus, I don't even know if it's here yet. It's all over Asia, it's all over Australia. God knows there are no rules for them bringing crap into the United States. Um, so I suspect it'll be here before too long, and it kills plants, dead. So this is leaf tip burn, calcium deficiency, nitrogen deficiency, too much, too much snow. You see how this has got that model netting appearance to it? It's kind of silvery and hazy. That's what spider mites are. Now, you'll be lucky to ever see a spider mite short of putting one under a microscope. If you've got really good eyes, and I don't. Down here, they're Do they? Down, there, down here, they're big enough to see. But it's not the top side of the plant, the leaf, it's the bottom. See that? That mottled, scaly appearance. It's real. They're real. They're there. I promise. I can't see them either. But that is spider mite damage. And if you start seeing that, it doesn't matter if you can see them or not, that's the problem you have. Erwinia. Some of you might recognize this from the repotting. Uh, this was one of the bulbs, and a couple of days before, this plant was really healthy, had no issues. And when I repotted it, you know, look at that. It's like orchid bulb soup, like porridge. It's just soft, and it smells weird. Um, when you cut any of this stuff off, sterilize whatever you cut it with. Erwinia is a bacterial-like organism. It's transmitted in water droplets. But if you don't dry out whatever you cut with it, you will transfer that to the next plant you touch with that. And it is an aggressive little pathogen. Scale. Scale happens. It does. Sometimes it's hard to check on these big plants. You get these balls that grow so close together. It's kind of like trying to grow Brotonias or Brotonia hybrids. I, I have yet to see a why not that doesn't have scale somewhere in the middle. Um, there are a couple of things that are easy to do for scale. The, the neonics, the neonicotinamides, um, like imidacloprid, safari, uh, or some of the things they're selling like bear, rose, and flower. I know a lot of people use that because it's available. That has imidacloprid in it. Imidacloprid is very dangerous to anything that has more than, more than two legs. More than four legs, actually. Um, it's what we give to dogs and cats to go fleas. Okay. Um, they make a couple of formulations that I'm particularly fond of. One is a pelletized form, and it's for control. A bear makes it, it's a big blue chug. It's pellets, sprinkles, brown. Um, and it's for controlling termites. And all it is is a time-released pelletized in the clover. And if you have a real bad problem on a couple of your plants, you take a spoonful of this and scatter it around on your plant, and you don't have to worry about that anymore. Now, that being said, the bad thing about neonics is that there is still some concern that maybe they're killing honeybees, or maybe they're showing up in the food chain and songbirds. If you're going to use them, just be careful. Don't wash them down the sink. Just be careful. Don't let it get outside your greenhouse. Virus. Here's one of those little strips. This actually came out of a, pretty sure it won't. This actually came off of an intermediate that I bought, a cat with the intermediate. Um, but you can see the little line, and you can see the little line. That's the, that's the, po that's the control, that's the positive. These, cheap, these tests are pretty cheap. They're less than $10 a piece, you know, if you, if you really want to go to the trouble of testing your plants. It's easy to do. That being said, there are a couple hundred different viruses out there that infect plants. And most of those will infect orchids. And all most people know about are three. Cymbidium mosaic, Adonoglossum ring spot, and now Cymbidium plecta. Most people only know about two of them. Yeah, there are a lot of pathogen, uh, pathogens out there. Most of them are not worth worrying about. <laughs> this is Cymbidium mosaic virus. You can see why they call it mosaic virus. Because it creates a mosaic-like pattern, and it can, be, it can be subtle, or it can be really, really dramatic and apparent. Some Cymbidium species, particularly Encephalium hybrids, we're going to talk about this, have what they call ticking 
they can have little teeny black spots on the foliage. It's considered a fault by commercial hybridizers. They try and breed it out. But you have to notice, because in most heat tolerance and videos, there's going to be insofolium in the background. And it can produce this ticking. Do not mistake it for Cymbidium mosaic virus. It's not necessarily a disease. It's just a consequence of the plant's metabolism. This is, um, this is fleck virus. This isn't my photograph. Um, this is out of Australia. Again, it's very, very subtle. You see this model of chlorotic appearance to this? If you start seeing this on any of your plants, start asking for help. You need to find out what's going on. In, in cymbidiums especially, it can, be, it can be an indicator of a real serious issue. This fleck virus is real and it's common. There you go. Some species, it's fully in a dark ticking. Cymbidium leaves will respond to injury by blackening as well. So if you hit one really hard with a potting tool or something like that, you crush one when you're bending it over, it'll turn black, it'll freak out. Now, we're going to talk about the species that go into these. And we're going to go over this pretty quickly. But the things that we're talking about here, these are all the pendant species. And these are all the upright species that have any degree of warmth or heat tolerance. And the ones that are starred are the ones that have tend to be used the most. Aloefolium, Canaliculatum, say that five times fast, Canaliculatum, um, Medidum, and then the uprights, Ensifolium and Sinensi. All these others have played a part, or are playing more and more of a part in hybridizing as hybridizers use them. But for the most part, all the others have been ignored. Symbol, Cymbidium ensifolium. This is the basis, the genuine basis for heat tolerant hybridizing. If you don't have a plant of, 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 of if you don't have a cymbidium and you want to grow cymbidiums in the heat, and you can find a cymbidium ensifolium, that's a great place to start, especially if you prefer species. This is a very compact plant. And they've been grown in China for centuries. First recorded grown in Europe in, in what, 1791. And like I said, they are the keystone of heat, heat tolerance and video breeding. They bloom now. Yes, ma'am? Did you say that they were fragrant also? Oh, okay. tremendously fragrant. They smell citrusy. And I've had people walk into, my, walk into my greenhouse and go, what is that smell? Because they just finished blooming. This is an albiform. This is Everglades. This is a tetrapoid form. Does everybody know what I mean when I say tetrapoid? <laughs> What I'm referring to are the number of chromosomes orchids have. And you may hear people who know a lot about orchids talking about diploid or tetrapoid or antipoid. What tetrapoid means is it has twice the normal number of chromosomes. Normally there's a pair, two chromosomes, diploid. Okay? If you get another pair in there, that's four chromosomes. That's tetrapoid. Sometimes tetrapoid is good, sometimes it's not. Most of the time, it's better than not having it, but only from the standpoint of breeding. Okay? Can you go back to the China? Or does it say where in China? Uh, I, I think all over China. Oh. I mean, I, I don't think there was any. This was a plant that was grown um, by royalty. You know, like so many things in China, the, the class system, you just didn't grow certain things if you weren't in that class or do certain things. It does have a colored form. Cyan Mincy? This is from a friend <coughs> in Malaysia. I don't know. I've never seen a true colored cymbidium encephalium. I've never seen it. This is, that's the best cymbidium encephalium I've ever seen uh, as far as shape. Uh, I have this one. It'll produce 10, 10 blooms on a plant this big. It'll produce 10, 10 flowers on spike and five spikes on a little orange pot. There it is, in fact. Look at that. You got one, two, three. This was on a band here. And it makes things that are very heat tolerant, but these hybrids are a little old now. What you can tell about these hybrids, though, is quite a few of them are yellow. Because we used an alba form of ensifolium to make them, and when you cross that with another alba form, a lot of the albas and cymbidiums don't come out white. They come out yellow. White is a specific genetic characteristic that is not albinism, at least in some videos. So you see a lot of bright yellow things like this. And you can see things that bloom at the right time of year. 
or that like bright light, we put them in more bright light to give them more stuff. Chlorophyll's main metal, the metal atom that it is built around is magnesium. Okay? And what sunlight does to chlorophyll over a period of time is it destroys it. That photonic radiation will destroy that chemical, chlorophyll. But they need chlorophyll to do what they do. And chlorophyll's made mostly of magnesium. That's the most important element. So I supplement my guys with magnesium. I do that with Epsom salts, which is magnesium sulfate. And I put, it, I put a teaspoon in a gallon of water. And you don't have to do more than a teaspoon in a gallon of water. I know that sounds like a lot. They don't need a lot of magnesium to do well. They just need more. So the brighter they grow them, the more magnesium they're going to need. You can't forget this, or your leaves will yellow. Leaves will also yellow because they're not getting enough nitrogen. So again, brighter light, more stuff. And this applies to all of your plants. How often do you put them in? Twice a year. Twice a year. I do it in spring, I do it in fall. Did you say um, boric acid? Ma'am? Did you say boric acid? No, ma'am. I said Epsom salts. Oh, okay. Magnesium sulfate. Um, I do it twice a year. Some people do it at extra time in the winter, right before it gets really cold, because that helps with leaf rot. Um, it helps with plants that might yellow. Gives them a little more uh, oomph in the winter when they're not getting as much. Okay. Good light. This is something else that will happen. If you grow a plant in really less than mm -hmm. ideal light conditions, mm -hmm. and then in ideal light conditions, you grow the exact same plant in those mm -hmm. two conditions, two plants. What you mm -hmm. will know is that the plant that's not getting enough light will get really, really thready, scraggly, leggy. There you go, leggy, thank you. Um, and the plant that's grown in really good light will stay compact. The leaves will be shorter, they'll be darker, they'll be stiffer. The plant will do much better. Now this is where we moved all the plants to. We put them outside. Uh, this is 50% shade. The sun at midday is 10,000 foot candles. Everybody knows you want to grow a band at 3,000 foot candles. These are growing in 5,000 foot candles of light. They get, these actually get supplemented with magnesium three times a year, and they get a boatload of fertilizer. Stupid thing. And when we moved all the plants out mm -hmm. from where they were for a couple of years into this, they all bloomed that year, every one of them, versus none of them or only one or two of them blooming a year for the last two years. They all bloomed a year. They have to when it's cold at night, this can be a problem. If you're blooming something in the summer, and it's 90 degrees and it's 80 degrees at night, you can tell pretty quickly if it's warmth tolerant or heat tolerant. Because heat tolerant cymbidiums can take temperatures into the 80s at night and still bloom well. With excellent flower size, quality, color, and number. This is a standard cymbidium. It's a very special standard cymbidium. It's Milton's favorite parent at the time because for whatever reason, and I don't understand it, none of my friends understand it, friends that have grown orchids longer than me, friends that have grown cymbidiums that are masters of cymbidium culture. But this one blooms in Palm Beach County, Florida, year after year, without any issue. It's not as bright red as this, but it blooms. So it's become a favorite parent of his, simply because its genetics are going to get passed on. Does anybody understand why red flowers don't bloom as red when it's warm? We've got a little Elaine Taylor for sale up there on the, on the, on the thing, Potnar Elaine Taylor. It's bright red because it has Sophronitis coccidia way in its background. Sophronitis coccidia is this little dwarf thing. It's brilliantly orange fire engine red. And it comes from the highlands of Brazil along the coast where it gets cold. And the reason they are bright red is because they're hummingbird pollinating, because they live at an altitude where butterflies really aren't flying around, where there aren't a lot of bees, so they have to appeal to the hummingbirds. Now, obviously, because it grows at such an altitude, in such conditions, it, it imparts that cold tolerance, if you will, to its flowers. Now, that Potnara, Elaine Taylor, Carl Smith, sitting over there, will bloom twice a year. It'll bloom in January, and it'll bloom again right about now. The ones that bloom now come out muddy. They all bloom now, but the, the plants that are blooming now come out muddy. And the ones that, that bloom in the winter come out bright, bright, bright red. The reason that is is because just like cymbidiums, the pigment 
that produces red in these flowers called anthocyanin is a result of their production of carbohydrates. In other words, their normal meta metabolism and physiology. And what happens is when it's really bright during the day, they make a lot of this stuff. The only way they can, the only way they can turn it into pigment is if it gets below a certain temperature at night. And so if you have a plant that blooms out in the summer, it's pretty muddy in color, it's supposed to be red, either cool it down or try and get it to bloom in the winter if you can. A lot of these you can, but that's why this one comes out looking kind of muddy in, in the summer for us. Again, it's a great parent because it's enormous. Those flowers are four inches across. Now, this looks like a standard, but the truth of it is that this is actually a heat tolerance submitted. This is a warmth tolerance submitted. This is apple moon. You can see it's starting to look more and more like a standard submitted. But as you move away from that, you get to things like this. And you can see, and when I say heat tolerant, you can almost immediately tell if the flower has very narrow sepals and petals, then it's more likely going to be warmth or heat tolerant and not just a bad hybrid because of what's in it, because of the species behind the hybrid. But this one bloomed out very well for us because it doesn't have a lot of anthocyanins in it. It doesn't have a lot of pink uh, or red. It just got this, like its name, pink flush. But it's still, the lips develop very, very well. When I say heat tolerant, this one tends to bloom in late spring for us, so it's not such an issue. The temperatures get a little colder there. It's not such a problem. And the yellows, well, the yellows, this is, by the way, this is the same thing. This is Christian Heritage Pink Flush. This is Christian Heritage Sunshine Tomorrow. Same seed pod, just so you know, okay? Uh, the yellows bloom really, really well. So do the greens, so do the whites. They don't have to make anthocyanin pigments. All they have to do is concentrate on making a pretty flower. So realize that the next time you're at an orchid show, you go to buy something really bright red. Unless it's a Renanthera, which is a completely different kind of orchid, if it's really bright red and it's related to anything out of South America at all, then it's probably not going to do real well for you, at least in flowering, if you can't get it to flower when it's cool. But again, since this has more yellow in it than anything else, it bloomed out very, very well. Uh, the carotenoids and the yellow anthocyanin pigments that make this color are much easier to produce when it's warm. Same thing with a little bit. Same thing with Dutchman's Gold. This is one of my favorites because Milton had a plan of this when I first came into the greenhouse. And the reason it's a favorite of mine is because it was growing in a bushel basket. It was growing in basically a 25 gallon container. And he had wanted to take it to the World Orchid Conference in Miami at the time, and it would have won. It would have won hands down. The thing had probably 100 spikes on it with this many flowers per spike. It was enormous. And the reason I remember this one so well is because after it, went, after it finished blooming, Milton said, because I'm young, strong, hey, Brian, could you repot that for me? <laughs> it made about 15 plants. It made about 15, and I still have one. It's one of my favorites. Now, terrestrial. Most folks who grow orchids are accustomed to the idea that orchids are either terrestrial or epiphytic, arboreal. They either grow on something or in something. And if they grow in something, we call them terrestrial. That's a load of hope. It really is. There are so many different ways to grow terrestrials because there are so many different habitats that these terrestrials grow in. Sabidiums are really called humus, humus epiphytes. You go out into the woods where there's a lot of leaves, you scoop that earth up right on top, and you can smell it. It smells like dirt. It smells good. It's fluffy. It's, it holds water real well, but it never gets soggy. That's humus. You have to go down another foot before you get to the dirt, before you get to the clay. These don't grow in that. They grow in this layer of decomposing organic matter that lies on top of the dirt itself. And mm -hmm. just by picking that up, you can understand more about how they grow and what they need. Yeah, they need a little more moist. They need a constant, even moisture. They need to get air to the roots, though. You don't put them in clay. You don't put them in potting soil. Can, I don't recommend. So, indeed, many Cymbidium species actually are epiphytes in the sense that they grow on trees, but they tend to grow on trees where there's a deep layer of moss or a lot of dead material has collected around their roots. 
Again, not epiphytic like cat litter. Terrestrial, not terrestrial like a sunflower. Hemus epiphytes. Now, some simidians are true terrestrials. There are a couple of species that are incredibly weird. They don't have any leaves. Uh, they're saprophytic. They, they, there are a couple of species. If you're really interested in them, you can go look them up. We really can't grow them. It's very hard because they're dependent on several different kinds of fungi and soil to provide everything they need. The only time they ever see them is when they produce a flower spike, and they only do that for reproductive purposes. And the rest of the time, they exist as roots underground. This is Milton Carpenter, and this is a low folium. This cymbidium is, he's, by the way, he's about four inches taller than I am. And this is the size of a VW Beetle. I mean, it really is. There's my truck in the background, and it really is. If I were to take this down and put it in the back, it would sit on top of my truck, cover the whole foot up. Um, but it's growing in a tree. Doesn't that make it epiphytic? See, don't take those words and take them at face value. Don't take those words. They're, they're, they're not going to be this neat little compartment that you can fit orchids into. They're all different. The cymbidiums, they're not terrestrial in the sense that they don't grow in dirt. So if someone wants to argue with you they're terrestrial, yeah, let them go. And then grow your orchids the way you want, and you'll do better than they will. Potting. They have really, they, again, they like the potting mix that retains moisture. They want to stay moist. They don't ever want to dry out completely. Now, they do appreciate air. They do appreciate having that open mix, but it's got to be absorbent. Most of the time, actually all the time now, I grow them in plastic pots. I've experimented and grown them in other things because, you know, just got to find out. But they do really well in plastic pots. Now, they, like I said, need good airflow. The bigger the pot, the coarser the mix. Everybody knows that, right? Okay? The bigger your pot, the more coarse your mix has to be, because it's easier to waterlog a big pot than a small pot. Now, coarser mix. I would never grow these things in the big chunks that we grow phalaenopsis in. I really rarely would grow them in anything as big as what we would use for cattleyas. But I would go to a medium mix as opposed to a fine mix. And I, I actually, I'm, I'm a little intense about this. I screen out all my stuff because I want to make certain I know exactly what I'm getting. So I grow them in a medium mix if they're in a big pot, a fine mix if they're small, and a seedling mix if they're seedlings. They really like developing long roots. Anytime someone comes up to you and says, hey, here's a terrestrial orchid, grow it. I want to see the pretty flowers, like paths. How many people kill paths in this room? How many people kill slip orchids? I killed my share. You know how you get to be an expert? You kill your dry weight in orchids. I've done that. I weigh 230 pounds, guys. It's a lot of dead orchids in my wake. You can only learn more by making mistakes, right? So if you grow paths, or you grow any other terrestrial orchid, or you grow some videos, you're not really growing a plant, and you're not really growing flowers. You're growing a root system. And you can tell everything you need to know about how well that plant's doing by looking at its roots. They like deep pots. Don't plant them in anything shallow. The deeper the pot you can find, the better. The narrower, deepest pots work really well. So this is a good root system. That plant came out of, I think, a, an eight-inch pot. We were repotting that one. But you can see, these roots are basically just like a cattleya's roots. They have that outer layer of velvet, which dries and makes them white when it's dry. You can see the little growing tips. They're green. They have a core, which is the real root, just like a cattleya. These things are not that different from any other orchid you're growing. So don't be afraid of them. These are the pots I use. Um, I don't even remember where I got these, and that's a huge issue because now I can't find them. Uh, but I've got about 100 of these that I grow them in, and you can see they're very, very deep, and they have excellent drainage. They're really good for us, for the bigger slip orchids too, like the, the Rothschildian hybrids and things like that. Again, great drainage. There's basically nothing to the bottom. Now you can achieve this with, you know, a nail and a deep pot, you know, a blowtorch and a nail just to make your pots drain as quickly as possible. So potting mix. 
There's all different kinds of stuff. Fur bark, you know, uh, I've seen people grow them in sphagnum. I grow them in this, which is, actually this is a little less than 50-50, but I grow in a 50-50 organic uh, to non-organic mix, and I use the Orchiata bark, which you got there. Um, Andy, my, my friend, the hybridizer, he grows in nothing but straight Orchiata right out of the bag. So, let me go back to here. So the thing you have to remember, though, is it, it really depends on your habits, and what the plant needs and what your habits are. You can only get to your plants once a week to water them. You probably don't want to put them in a completely organic, chunky mix because they're going to dry out by the time you get back. And if you're like me and you're an idiot with a watering wand and just think, oh, I'm doing a lot of good for my plants every time you water them, every time you see them, and they rock, you probably want to put them in a mix like this, which is exactly what I do. Repotting. This is daunting. You saw the plant with all the roots. That was an eight inch pot. You can imagine what a plant in a, in a big 25 gallon pot looked like. So repotting these things can be really daunting. Well, the good news is they don't need to be repotted that often. They really like being compressed. They love growing all the way out and over the edge of their pot. But at a certain point in time, like when your pots break because the plants are outgrowing them, you have to do some repotting. It's not really that different than any other repotting method, but there are a couple of things to be aware of. Mostly the fact that these roots, there tend to be a lot of rotten ones in the middle, a lot of mushy ones. It's very easy to find them, and they all need to come out. When you're dividing them, you can divide them just like anything else, but again, like most orchids, you want to try and divide them when the roots are growing well. If you don't have a good root system, then don't repot right away. Okay? You can divide them just like you divide anything else. Find the leaves, divide from the center out. Okay? Here's the lead. These are all old pseudobulbs. There's a lead here and a lead here. There's actually two leaves here and one there. And you can see in the middle, this is a lot of the old, chunky mix that is now, you know, basically decomposed. Oh, I use pellet and fertilizer. I do not use Osmocote. Osmocote releases its, uh, releases its nutrients at the wrong time, and you can burn your orchids that way. Something like Nutricote, which is also called dynamite, if you can find it, works really well, however, because it is released over a longer period of time in relation to how much water you get. MSU. MSU, oh, MSU is just something, my orchids always get fertilizer. Every time I water, they get fertilizer. But I also put on pelleted fertilizer about twice a year. Okay. So you can see these are the roots that aren't alive. They're not real hard to find. And once you pick these out and get rid of them, you'll find the job is actually a lot easier because sometimes it'll take away a third of the mass that you're working with. Again, you see a dead, squishy root right here. They're kind of hollow. They got this core. I like to just pull off the outer sheath. Um, I don't really have, I've never cut one of these open and put it under a microscope to look. But I have a sneaking suspicion that the main root is still alive to some degree and can still do its job to some degree. Plus, uh, if you've got a whole bunch of little bare roots poking out, it holds it in the pot a little better. But I do like to get rid of the dead velamen because it does tend to hold water and it's to get water on. And you break it down, break off the bracts, figure out what you're getting rid of and what you're keeping. Now, the big ones, it's surgery. Because what I do is I get a machete or a big butcher knife, or I've got a really nice Japanese pull saw, and I just divide these things into as many parts as I think needs to be done. I'll start with half and see if it pulls apart after that and work from there. So you can see two really good divisions. This one has one, two, this one has two leaves. This one has probably three or four because they're on the other side. Pick your pots appropriately. I'm picking a, a slightly bigger pot for that, but it's not going to be over potted because it's a much bigger plant than when it went into that pot. And you want to fill your potting mix up right to the base of the pseudobulbs. It's got to be, it's got to be real up in there. They've got to be snug. You've got to pack this material down into there. You've got to get it up to the right height because they start growing roots out right here and moisture is going to help them initiate root growth. If you don't get it up high enough, once the roots come out, they're going to dry, the tips are going to die, and then you won't get any roots. So just, just over. It'll all settle down too. 
You know that as well as I do. A week later, you're wondering where half your bottlenecks went. So, two freshly repotted plants. You can propagate these things from back bulbs. The ones that are hard and are green, oftentimes, as a matter of fact, more often than not, these will produce a new plant. It doesn't always work. There's a lot of hope involved. But there are some very specific things that you can do to make that happen. Bad picture, sorry about the folks. But don't throw this away because making new plants to bring to the show table or to the trade table or to give to friends, that's half the joy for me of growing orchids. So you can see they have little eyes, just like every other symposium orchid that you grow, just like a cat, they have little eyes. The way to get them, yeah, see the scale? I'm not perfect. The way to get them to bloom, there are a couple of different ways. I like planting them in plastic pots and then not watering them. You don't want to water them because if you do, they don't have any roots. If you keep them too wet, it will rot. And that's a bad thing because you won't get any new plants will rot too well. You can take them and you can take some barely damp sphagnum moss. Barely damp. Just that it feels cool. Put it in a Ziploc bag, put these in. Don't close it all the way, close it most of the way and set it up. If you're lucky, in a couple of months, you'll see one of these little eyes start to